الشيطان اللئيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي making a quick recap of our discussions uh, so far we said in our earlier discussions that uh, the question of uh, self purification has been given the topmost significance in the holy quran on account of uh, the swearings uh, which are found in surah shams whenever allah swears uh, and then concludes uh, it tells us uh, that the message is extremely significant in surah shams we find almighty allah swearing 11 times uh, which is found none elsewhere in the holy quran and then concluding qad aflaha man zakkaha indeed uh, successful is he who has purified his nafs uh, وقد خاب من دساها and he is in a loss who has corrupted it so we said we ought to understand on a couple of issues pertaining to this process of purification of the nafs and uh, we said likewise uh, that this process is undertaken by the process of takhliya uh, which means first and foremost a person is supposed to eliminate and eradicate in him uh, moral vices uh, guna and the likes of it uh, and later on after its elimination a person is supposed to undergo the process of tahliya whereby is now supposed to inculcate in him the issues of moral virtues uh, acts of worship etc and then there is the process of tajliya which is uh, not going to be discussed uh, on account of its uh, substance matter we still have a couple of lessons uh, two three more to find up finalize the issue of tahliya and then we will come to tahliya inshallah at a later stage we said uh, when comes the question of tahliya the question of the elimination of moral vices sins uh, the issue ought to be understood is pertaining to the question of uh, violating the commandments of almighty allah and when we are talking pertaining to the question of the violations of allah's commandments uh, one particular point which ought to be understood is that uh, when sharia has enlisted uh, guna e kabira and guna e saghira it does not in any way mean uh, one ought to do guna e saghira mind you persistence in guna e saghira is tantamount to guna e kabira one ought to understand against whom one is committing this guna that is the yardstick how great he is but the question of saying this is saghira and this is kabira does not form any material foundation one ought to understand the greatness against whom uh, this sin is committed so persistence in guna saghira is tantamount to guna kabira so when talking about guna in general we were picking up a couple of ayahs in the quran whereby we saw well from the quranic verses we deduced that uh, once a person is uh, accustomed to guna accustomed to the violations violations of allah's commandment uh, he sees the things otherwise he loses his nature we did quote a tradition of our dear masum likewise then we went further to talk about the holy quranic ayats whereby one loses his aqaid one loses his akhlaq one's end moment as he's parting from this temporary world is questionable and likewise at the end of the day when he lands up in that divine court of justice sir, his place is in hell So the issue is of extreme significance that one ought to understand uh, what are the self precautionary measures which a person is supposed to undertake uh, as to remain uh, safe uh, from committing guna we said uh, that the basic texts of ours are uh, mentioning a couple of methods spiritual method supervisory methods uh, which ought to be implemented as to remain safe uh, from uh, diversions and deviations first and foremost we said is pertaining to the question of uh, musharata that is uh, in brief uh, summing up the musharata process that when one wakes up safe and sound in the morning 
one ought not to take that day, that additional day for granted. It's an additional day to be worked upon. Right, he ought to address himself uh, that, oh my enough, sir, had you been dead, uh, what would have been the case? But now as you are awake, uh, Allah has given you a de new day to invest upon. He should bring into that consideration uh, that he was dead and he saw the perils of the interior and of the barzakh world and he asked Allah and he cried to Allah and he pleaded to Allah for a return. Allah granted him that permission. And now what? Likewise, he's supposed to bring that into imagination uh, that sleep is a temporary death and I've been granted a real life, a real life. Had it been a permanent death, then what? Likewise, he's supposed to bring other ayahs in the Quran which ulamas have enumerated in details uh, and the riwayats in detail which a person is supposed to bring to his mental level and undertake this particular process of musharata against himself, against his nafs, to be more specific in the line of our discussion. Having done that now, he's now entering into the second stage, which is of extreme significance. Huh? And we intend to spend some time into it, at least, if not a three, two classes. And then comes the process of muhasaba, important too. And then comes the process of mu'atheba, important too. When we are talking about the process of muraqeba, one has done the shart with his organs, with his nafs. He's now entering into the world now. He has started his day. A student has started his day. Likewise, a moment has started his day and is now moving uh, as per his requirements. That particular person ought to undergo muraqeba. Muraqeba, ulama of akhlaq have said, uh, is uh, divided into two parts. The former muraqeba is that uh, a person ought to be watchful over himself uh, that the conditions which he has done at dawn ought not to be trampled upon. This is the first muraqeba. The second muraqeba is uh, extremely important, which will strengthen the former muraqeba. And that is, uh, if at all he wants to be watchful over himself, he ought to understand someone is watchful over himself. That will make muraqeba effective. When one wants to be obtain a close scrutiny over his self, uh, that the conditions ought not to be violated. I've made a condition with my eyes, uh, or my eyes, you are not supposed to look at na mahram. And as you moved in the streets, uh, the condition was violated. That is a break of musharata. Muraqeba was not implemented there. That one ought to be careful of that condition that my eyes will not move towards those things which earn the displeasure of Almighty Allah. And likewise with other organs. So muraqeba basically is uh, having two components. One is uh, one ought to be careful over his own self that the violations ought not to be undertaken, that which he made at dawn. Muraqeba means to be a raqib over oneself. The latter muraqeba is one ought to understand that Allah is looking at him. That will make him look at himself, which is a later stage of discussion which we look into, inshallah, in the succeeding class. When coming to the former muraqeba, it is of extreme significance. Allama Marhum Tabatabai, a monumental figure in the Shi history. Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi says, uh, I wonder how the earth could bear such a person. He was such a, a giant. Huh? And his monumental work, Tafsir al Mizam, is well understood. And a piece of counsel coming from him. One student of his mentions, uh, pertaining to this first type of muraqeba, we are in just in the first type of muraqeba. We want to obtain a clear cut direction so that the package is well digested as we inshallah close up. He says that we special students used to have special classes uh, with the sage. We used to go and study as far with him, a complex book of Ibn Sina. Right? Uh, and likewise, uh, at times, uh, we used to have a special season with him uh, to get advices. And once it so happened uh, that in these special sittings of ours, whereby we selected pupils went to him, uh, he advised us uh, that if at all uh, one wants to obtain a success, uh, these are words not coming out from any ordinary mouth, 
If at all any person wants success in this dunya and in the akhirat, then uh, it is necessary for a spiritual traveler, that is we, we have undertaken this journey. We are uh, undertaking a spiritual journey, right? By understanding these processes, we, have, we are undertaking the suluk ilallah. Our journey is towards Almighty Allah. It is necessary for that spiritual traveler uh, from day one, that is uh, from the day he has started this journey, from Buluk perhaps, uh, to his last day, he is supposed to be practicing muraqibah. It is necessary for sire suluka, for a spiritual traveler heading for the spiritual migration towards Allah to understand and to implement the question of muraqibah. And it is even mentioned that during his dying moments of life, when he could hardly speak, dying moments of life, uh, a couple of people went for advice at that moment. And he could hardly speak, this great man. Uh, during that moment, he said, muraqibah, muhasibah. One ought to undertake these two processes. The question of muraqiba and muhasaba. So this is of prime significance and this is extremely important. One ought to be careful or in oneself. So far, so good then. Now, before coming to the second muraqiba, which will strengthen the former muraqiba, there is one question which I would like to dwell upon and a very serious question pertaining to the question of Iman. Last time we did discuss, uh, rather we did throw this statement uh, that uh, how come though we know, yet we, Violet, what's the problem, where is the problem? A very significant subject. Because when we will come to the second sort of muraqiba, that Allah is omnipresent, Allah is all seeing, uh, and Allah is all hearing, uh, yet we do sin, uh, that means there is something wrong with our iman. If at all we could not sin against a boy who is watching us, uh, how could we sin uh, before Almighty Allah? The problem is Iman. Where is, where is the problem? The problem is Iman. Right? Do we really have that Iman that Allah is omnipresent, uh, Allah is all seeing and Allah is all hearing? If so, then how could one dare uh, sin? So the second muraqiba is to inshallah prove it fruitful uh, Let's have a word or two pertaining to the question of Iman. Eh? Generally and specifically to that second muraqiba, that when we discuss that Allah is omnipresent, eh? we really mean that Allah is omnipresent. And we really ought to be a stepping stone for our improvement. So allow me then to dwell upon this significant subject. What is Iman? Is Iman knowing? Is Iman uh, accepting or is it something else? According to Quran, Iman does not mean knowing uh, and according to Quran, Iman does not mean accepting only. Then what is Iman? So that we will implement uh, whatever we are learning and whatever we are studying uh, in our religious assemblies uh, and go to the question of its implementation. It should not just rest right at one place. Simply attending uh, the assemblies of learning is not Iman. Or simply accepting, yes, it's not Iman either according to the Holy Quran. Then what is Iman? In general, we will know how then to implement the things we will be learning. And in particular, that second muraqiba ought to materialize from this particular understanding. When we are talking of Iman, first and foremost, it ought to be understood uh, that uh, for one to obtain uh, eternal felicity, sa'adat abadi, it's iman, nothing short of that. Iman in what? Iman in Allah and whatever he has revealed. That is iman. And if at all one wants to earn eternal damnation, it is kufr. So iman is of prime significance. One ought to have iman, right? Uh, so according to Quran, uh, you will come across uh, ayahs related to Pharaoh, which we had discussed sometimes earlier, uh, which I would like to rerun this evening, uh, so that we know what is Iman from Quranic point of view. In Quran, Allah is mentioning uh, pertaining to Fir'aun. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Lakad alimta ma anzal haulai illa rabbu samawati wal arab. I said Lakad in Arabic means double emphasis. 
right? Uh, Allah mentions uh, that this Pharaoh knows for certainly that what was revealed is from the Lord of the skies and the earth. He knows it. Now I'm telling you what is Iman from Quran. Is it simply knowing, uh, simply sitting here and that's Iman or simply accepting that's Iman or something else? So that the latter issues could be well understood in the light of this discussion. Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah is mentioning about the same person. He knew for certain about what was revealed on Musa, on Tawheed, on Nubu'a, he knew it. In fact, not only he knew it, he was certain about it. He had obtained the stage of certainty. وَجَهَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْكَنَتْهَا He knew it, yet he covered. Elsewhere in the Quran, it is mentioned, مَا أَلِمْتَ لَكُمْ إِلَّا إِلَهِ غَيْرِ he is mentioning what to Fir'aun. Huh? I don't myself, I don't myself, I don't myself befitting anyone huh, than I as your God. I find myself the most befitting to you as your God. He's making this claim. This is the ayat meaning. I am befitting to be your God. The same person who knows is coming to this conclusion. So where is the problem? Is Iman then simply agreeing, simply knowing? No from Quran. Iman does not mean that Pharaoh knew, yet he said, I find myself more befitting uh, to be your Allah. Pharaoh is saying this. Uh, so Iman from Quranic perspective does not simply mean uh, sitting, uh, a person like me sitting here and hearing, and that is Iman, or agreeing to it is Iman. No, Iman is something else. When we hear Allah is Hazir and Nazir, when we hear Allah is Qadir, when we hear Allah is uh, the crux of the entire universe, right? It means uh, in the real sense of the word. Not simply, yes, he is, uh, and that's the end of the story. Or not simply accepting it, and that's the end of the story. No. Iman means, Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, may God elogate his life. Uh, he has done a couple of research on this particular issue of Iman. He says, uh, Iman from Quran does not mean simply understanding simply agreeing, uh, but it is something more than that. And then he enumerates a couple of lines to understand Iman. And allow me to mention what he has said. He said, uh, first and foremost, when it comes to the question of Iman, on Allah and Ma Anzal Allah, and whatever is revealed, one of them is this question which we are coming to, Murakiba. Right? He says, uh, first and foremost, for one to understand pertaining to the issue of Iman, First is pertaining to the question of one ought to acquire knowledge, obviously. Knowledge is the stepping stone. One ought to make a point uh, to sit down in assemblies uh, whereby he ought, on, he ought to earn knowledge, religious knowledge, on Tawheed, on Nubuwa, on ethical issues, on Ahkami issues, etc., etc. Second point, uh, when one listens to such teachings, uh, one ought to listen and one ought to digest and one ought to understand from a rational dimension. Make that a point. When one understands religion, let him understand it in a rational manner, from a logical aspect, from a dalili aspect, number two. And number three, that particular teaching which he has learned uh, ought to be there in his mind. You see, the problem with me and the problem with the likes of me is what? That when we hear a particular aspect in Islamic sciences, uh, that particular piece of knowledge is there in me, only to be implemented when the time comes of it. That is not Iman ilma zinda, as they call it. One ought to keep those sciences and those understandings uh, in an active stage, not at a passive stage. It only becomes active when the time arises, otherwise it goes in the store of passiveness. It should be at the level of activity. And number four, he says, uh, put that particular thing into practice. That is Iman. Short of that, uh, things can't work. That particular sciences which one has understood ought to be rationally understood, ought to be kept at an active level, and ought to be translated into action. If that occurs, that is Iman. Otherwise, that which one has learned uh, will get lost. And then when, is, when one is told Allah is present, uh, 
and there is kiamat, uh, and the day of judgment is going to dawn upon us, uh, it won't prove of value. It will go off. Why? Because those very same teachings have not been implemented. Have not been implemented. Simply the question is this way. That ilm is uh, amal and amal will result in iman. The equation is very important. Allow me to throw some light into it. Extremely important. Right? Because iman is the question of our life and death. It's the question of our life and death. Right? Uh, one will then tell me that is it possible when person knows about Allah and about Qiyamah, yet he diverts, it's possible. It's possible, which is not our topic of discussion this evening. It is possible. You know it. Pharaoh has proved it. It is possible. I know it, yet I won't agree. I know it, yet I will rebel. It is a possible, but that's not our topic of discussion. Why? Why should he rebel? Inshallah, if Allah gives us that tawfiq, maybe in the succeeding class. Why should he rebel? You know now Allah is present. Why should you go in contrast to it? What's the problem? That's not our topic of discussion this evening, but the point is, uh, if this is Iman, it ought to be translated into action. So the formula is very simple. Learning, uh, there is ilm, uh, rationally, putting it in a state of activity, and then translating into action. What does it do? What does it do? The equation is very simple. When one has ilm, uh, now try to be with me, and he does amal, right? Uh? When one does ilm, uh, he does amal, uh, Right? Knowledge, uh, and he puts it into action. If at all he puts that what he knows into action, uh, his iman will strengthen. Be with me, please. His iman will strengthen. That is A, put it one. That is one state of iman. Don't be contented with it. Right? Uh, when we are not contentment with material issues, uh, the more we get, the more we want. Uh, why are we contented with spiritual issues? Don't be contentment that I have this state of Iman, I should not work for others. Try from an elementary state and to a mild state and then to a difficult state. Right? And Iman is not something to be sensed materially. You will see his Iman by terms of his actions. And you will tell us this person has this Iman. Iman is something immaterial. The way happiness and sadness cannot be put in physical, tangible terms, likewise Iman is in the heart. If at all you want to see what is the state of Iman, see his actions. That is how it is assessed. So when a person knows, you have learned about Allah is Hazir and Nazir. You have learned about the day of Qiyamah. You have learned about the Risala of our Prophet and the Imama of our dear Imams. Peace be upon them all. Put that into action. When a person puts that knowledge of his uh, into work and into action, uh, his uh, Iman will get strengthened. That is one. When his uh, Iman gets strengthened, uh, obviously, from that Iman, his Amal now, in terms of quantity and quality, we won't be like number one, will it? Obviously not. It will be more strengthened because the Iman has become strengthened. So the Amal which he will now do won't be the way the Amal are in grade one. It will be at a more uh, strengthful area. Right now, once his Amal has increased, his Iman has increased. Once his Iman is increased, his uh, quantity and quality of his Amal will increase. And that is how things work upon. A very simple formula. I don't know whether I got it well. A person has a couple of understandings, right? He puts it into action. The Iman has got strengthened, right? When the Iman is strengthened, obviously the Amals emanating from this state of Iman won't be like the former one, will it? Why not? The former was a more feeble state than this later state. So his Amal will be more strengthened. When his Amal is more strengthened, obviously the Iman will get strengthened. When the Amal is still in part C, likewise the Amal expected from that Iman won't be the way it was in the former state. This is how the formula and this is how the equation goes forward. And if at all he does not put into action that which he knows, uh, the Iman will get weak. Simple as that. And the devil won't leave one alone. What we advise here, uh, that whatever little is known, 
put it into action. If at all we have learned uh, a debt, uh, half of it give it for charity, half keep it, implement it. The devil will tell you some minute uh, weight for your pockets to get full. No. You want your iman to get strengthened, give a half a debt in charity. When you wake up in the morning, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. When you sleep well, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. These so called petty deeds are of prime significance. Don't call them petty. Put things into action that will strengthen the Iman. That will strengthen Iman. And that ought to be implemented. And one ought not to go for uh, contentment. Allow me to speak an incident before I wind up the subject, which well tells us uh, that Iman is apparent from the way he lives. It is mentioned uh, that uh, Allama Radhi and Allama Murtaza, these two brothers, the teacher of Sheikh Mufid, once Sheikh Mufid sees in a dream uh, that Janab Sayyidah, Salawatullahi alayha, is holding the hands of uh, Hassanan uh, and is coming to Sheikh Mufid in the dream and telling Sheikh Mufid, uh, Ya Sheikh uh, Allim Ilmul Fiqh. Sheikh Mufid is perplexed. Janabe Sayyida and Imam Hassanan. The other day, he sees uh, a lady coming with two lads in his hands uh, and coming uh, to Sheikh Mufid. Sheikh Mufid teach them Fiqh. And the answer then was clear to him. Pertaining to these two brothers, see the state of Iman. Once upon a time, it so happened that there were only two. And uh, it is mustahab that the most pious ought to lead namaz al -jama ah. Right? Uh, so there were only two, Mufid, uh, Murtaza and Razi. Said Murtaza and Said Razi. Said Murtaza, wanted to tell his brother indirectly that the most uh, pious person ought to lead namaz al -jama He wanted to tell his brother that I am the most pious, so I am leading and you be the ma'amun. For uh, I have never ever committed a sin. The iman aspect is coming. For I have never ever committed a sin. Sayyid Razi, as a sign of respect, uh, he tells his brother uh, that uh, I have never even thought of committing a sin. So this is Iman. So I should lead the namaz al jamaah Status, right? Uh, Imam Khomeini, when he was in Paris, Shaykh Murtaza Mutahari visited him. And he makes a comment. Uh, at that time, he was 77. Allama Marhum Imam Khomeini. The doctors came to check his position, physical position. They said uh, he is hot right now. He is 77. He is walking like a young man. It is Iman in Allah. His heart currently is walking like a young man. This is Iman in Almighty Allah. And that is why he challenged it, that nothing can harm me to the Americans and to the Israelis. That's Iman about Allah's omnipresence. This is Iman. Right? One can notice from his statements, uh, one can notice from his walks of life, one can notice from his actions. Right? So when we discuss, inshallah, in the succeeding talk, that this muraqaba B is of prime significance to strengthen muraqaba A, it ought to be understood at this particular level. Right? At the end, uh, we recite a dua from dua makarimul akhlaq, the first para of Imam Sajjad, alayhi salam, Allahumma j'al bi imani akmal al iman. Wal yakini afzal al yakin. Wan tahi bi niyati ahsan al niyat. Wa bi amali bi ahsan al a'amal. Oh Allah, make my four things to reach to the apex. One, my iman. Second, my certainty. Third, uh, my intentions. And fourth, uh, my amal. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.